All right. Well, welcome to another episode of Open Bible, Open Life. I'm Kyle Mercer, lead pastor here of Two Cities Church. And today we have a special guest, the Lee Strobel. <laughs> Lee, thank you for being here. I'm glad to do it. I'm I'm episode four. Episode I, I, four. I'm honored. Yeah. Well, and Lee, you first of all, how are you feeling? We talked this morning. You're 72 yeah. years old. Yes. Uh, just lost 30 pounds. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah 39. 39 pounds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how we talked? You don't often do three services yet. Three right. services plus a podcast. How are you feeling coming into this? I'm feeling great. I I uh, I do have some voice issues sometimes. I was mentioning earlier. I almost died in 2011 and um, lost a kidney and lingered between life and death for almost a week. What happened? I had an unusual condition called hyponatremia, which is a severe drop in blood sodium. And um, normally for an American male, your blood sodium is on a very narrow band of like, I think the number is like 130. Hmm. Well, mine went down to 112. Which, if you tell a doctor that to say, oh, he died, right? I mean, you can't wow. do that. So you have hallucinations, which I did. Um, you have seizures. I didn't have those. But then you go unconscious, which I did, unless he found me unconscious. And I woke up in the emergency room. The doctor said, you're one step away from a coma, two steps away from dying. Wow. And the next step would have been coma and then death. So it's kind of an unusual thing uh, to have. <laughs> Um, the nice part is the doctor said, it'll never happen to you again. Wow. Because it was just a weird confluence of things that happened. Um, so that's the good news. But yeah. the bad news is your brain um, takes in moisture. Um, so your brain cells are expanding. Well, you don't have room in your cranium for, yeah, 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 yeah. for expansion. So that's why you have hallucinations, seizures, and then unconsciousness and death. Wow. So um, I lost a kidney and... Um, um, it actually is still there. It just shrunk and is no longer functioning. Wow. So, yeah, so my health's been uh, great since then. Um, um, you know, I'm otherwise uh, healthy. And, and sometimes, though, doing multiple services in a day, my voice gets a little husky. Yeah, no, and, I agree. Uh, so, yeah. One of the one of the things we talked about coat throat a uh, yes. little bit of <laughs> yeah that's a little great bit of a stuff. hat for speaking and those those who people who speak and sing so you shared a little bit about your story I shared a little bit in introducing you today yeah you know you come to Christ at 29 years old is that right uh, roughly yeah right around there yeah tell me let's go back even before we want I want to get to that your, yeah your story of Leslie your wife coming to Christ all that tell me about the family you grew up in what is your a question I like to ask people all yeah. the time. It's not a very offensive question. What is your spiritual background? So what was family of origin growing up? What, yeah. what did you believe? Yeah, my family was uh, Lutheran, um, uh, Missouri Senate. Okay. And uh, I had... That's a conservative. Yeah, conservative yeah. Lutheran yeah. denomination. My um, parents had three kids in a row, um, and then they were kind of done. I mean, yeah. My dad was done. Yeah. He was like, yeah, I did the parenting thing, and I'm done. Well, several <laughs> years passed, and all of a sudden I came along. There we go. And then my mom convinced my dad, well, he needs a playmate. So they had a little girl who's oh, my wow. younger sister. So we had five in our family. The problem was um, I never had a good relationship with my dad. And I think that was part of it is that he was kind of done and wanted to go play golf and was kind of yeah. yeah, yeah, done with yeah, the dad, which yeah, I yeah, get. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was kind of an unpleasant surprise. Um, so, uh, and I was a rebellious kid and I pushed all his buttons. And so uh, we had a difficult relationship. And if you study the famous atheists of history, yes, Camus, Sartre, Nietzsche, Freud, Voltaire, Wells, Feuerbach, O'Hare, every one of them either had a bad relationship with their dad, wow. their dad died when they were young, or divorced their mother when they were young. And the implication is well, why would you want to know a heavenly father if your earthly father has hurt you or yes. let you down or yes. disappointed you? So Freud talked about that, and, and um, uh, it's a deterrent for people wanting to find God. Mm. And did that contribute to me walking down a path of atheism? I think it was a factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not putting all the blame on my dad. I mean, I was a, I was a troubled kid and um, knew how to... Uh, what's the old saying? Uh, I know how to get your goat because I know where you keep it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I know where he kept his goat. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was probably a factor. Um, um, and we never really reconciled uh, that much. I mean, we had a cordial relationship. I remember we had a big blowout argument when I was um, just about to graduate from high school. Really? And, uh, Do you remember what it was about? Yeah, I had gone behind his back and done something he specifically told me not to do, which is to buy a motorcycle. 
okay. uh, covertly, and um, I lied and told them it was a friend's, and that's why it's being kept on our porch. <laughs> you know? I, I can't believe I thought I'd get yeah, away yeah, with yeah. this. But anyway, uh, they found out, and we had this big blowout, and he looked at me and said, I don't have enough love for you to fill my little finger. Oh, yikes. And so um, I walked out. I didn't know what to say. Yeah, and so I walked that, out, yeah. never intending to come back. I lived in an apartment up in uh, a town about 30 miles away and worked on a newspaper that summer. And um, um, my mom convinced me to come back, but then I went away to college. And so I never quite reconciled with my dad. Wow. Um, so that was always a sore spot. When, and when did he pass away? He passed away when I was in law school, oh, and um, okay. right as finals were beginning. And um, um, it was interesting because I, I went to the funeral, and yeah. I was at the wake, and uh, these men started to come up to me who I didn't know and mm. said, are you Lee? And I said, yeah. And they said, oh, man, your dad <clears throat> never stopped bragging about you. Wow. Oh, and you'd have a byline on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. He'd be showing everybody your byline. Well, oh, he never told man. me. You never knew that. You yeah. never knew that. So it kind of blew me away. And, and so I asked ultimately for everybody to leave. Um, and it was just me and my dad Wow. in the casket. My dad was in the casket, of course. And I, I said, I'm sorry. Powerful. The way that um, I behaved and, and the way I... Um, wow. hurt our relationship, and I apologize to him, and uh, I wish I'd done it when he was living. Yeah, yeah. So you you end up, how do you end up meeting, so let's skip ahead now yeah. a little bit, you meet Leslie, I think you yeah. mentioned today in the sermon, 1966? That's when, we, yeah, that's right, we were freshmen in high school, different high schools. It's funny, because we were in completely different spheres, mm -hmm. different suburb of Chicago, different school districts, different high schools, <clears throat> no common set of friends, except one guy who she met at a dance, and um, he lived in my neighborhood. <clears throat> and the day after Christmas, they went, took the train to downtown Chicago to return some Christmas presents. Yeah. And I happened to be in downtown Chicago with a friend of mine, just because that's what we would do. We'd take the train downtown and walk around downtown Chicago. And so I'm walking down near the train station, and this guy from our neighborhood who was with Leslie said, hey, Lee, I know that guy. Oh, I came over. He introduced me to Leslie. And she went home and told her mom, I met the boy I'm going to marry. Wow. And um, I got her phone number. <laughs> I can't remember how I did it. I can't remember if I tried to get her off of him or not. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I called her up, and, and we started um, seeing each other and taking the train together to downtown Chicago. And um, we, we broke up for a while in high school, but um, I knew the whole time. This is going to make her mad. I knew the whole time I could win her back. <laughs> I had a, a, a Volkswagen... Beetle, yeah. Uh, I call it the flying blueberry. It was blue. Mm -hmm. If I could just put on a racing stripe and get a fuzzy steering wheel, I knew I could win her back. Yes, and I did, and it worked. I, now she will tell me it had nothing to do with coming back with me, but I felt more confident. Yeah, 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 who wouldn't feel confident with a fuzzy steering wheel and, and yeah. a racing stripe? <laughs> <laughs> this is late late sixties, early seventies. That's right. That was uh, late sixties. So you guys get married when? I was 20, she was 19, 1972. Okay, so you guys are married for several years before she becomes a Christian. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this Quite is, we don't have to get too much into this, yeah. but but uh, I got to talk to Leslie just briefly, and we yeah. talked about just the Willow Creek, and at the time, yeah. that was just such an influential church, the amount of yes. people that came to Christ. How, how did she end up coming to Christ? Well, it's interesting. She met a Christian nurse who lived in the same, we bought a, con, or rented actually, a condominium, and in the building on the first floor was a woman named Linda and her husband, Jerry. They were strong Christians. And Linda had a gift of hospitality. And I always thought a gift of hospitality meant, oh, your house was perfect and you had the best china. No, gift of hospitality means come on in and make yourself yeah. at home, you know? And, and that's how she was. There'd be dirty ch uh, dishes in the sink sometimes, but she came over with a plate of cookies to welcome us to the condo. And she had her daughter on her hip. Well, her daughter was the same age as our daughter. So they became good friends. And then Leslie became friends with Linda. And they would hang out together and talk about God. Uh, Leslie wasn't hostile toward faith yeah, like yeah, yeah. I was. She was open. And, and so Linda was in a quandary, though, because she went to a traditional Bible church. Mm -hmm. And she knew <laughs> if she brought Leslie to that traditional church, Leslie mm -hmm. would have kind of freaked out. Yeah. So she thought, I'm going to check out this new church called Willow Creek that has a Sunday service 
for the unchurched. Yes. And so she went and checked it out. I thought, this is perfect. It's theologically conservative, but it's uh, avant-garde in terms of its presence. We had yep. drama, we had contemporary music. It was yes, very unusual yes, yes, back yes, then. Yes. And so um, she invited Leslie to come to church, um, which I freaked out over. Um, um, because it meant I was going to babysit the kids, and I had a hangover generally uh, Saturday night going into Sunday and didn't want to do that. But um, um, she started to go to Willow Creek with, with Linda and um, heard this gospel, and Linda uh, kind of walked her through a salvation and prayer, and she ended up coming to faith. Wow. So she comes to faith in Christ, comes home, and how does she yeah. tell you? Well, if you see the movie, they did you kinda, oh, it's very yeah, yeah. it's very accurate. I mean, um, uh, she came in; she had a lot of trepidation because she knew I was very hostile toward mm -hmm. religion, and um, she told me that she had become a follower of Jesus. And the first word that went through my mind was divorce. Really? Yeah, I was going to walk out. I, I didn't want to be married to a Christian. It's not part of the plan. Yeah, wasn't part of the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted the old Leslie back. Um, in fact, this is embarrassing, but uh, I usually don't tell this part, but she had just planted a beautiful flower garden in our backyard. And right after she told me, I, w I had to mow the lawn. I went out and I mowed down the flower garden. <laughs> <laughs> so angry. Yeah. So angry. Um, and so it really sparked an era of two things happening. One was um, an attraction toward the faith. In other words, mm. She was very winsome. She made some mistakes. She would put Christian books out on the coffee table with things underlined. Now, she knew yeah. that, that wasn't a good move. But um, the way she related to me and the mm -hmm. children and so forth, it was it was winsome and it was attractive. And so yes. that was pulling me toward faith. But at the same time, I wanted the old Leslie back. I wanted her old yeah, life back. I get it, I get it. So it was a push and pull yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, a yeah. thing. And I thought, you know, I've been trained in journalism and law, and I thought I could probably disprove the resurrection in a three-day weekend. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You can't because you can't be resurrected if you're dead. So let's start there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I decided to take my journalism training and legal training and investigate, um, hoping. Now, I did it because I was trained at the University of Missouri Journalism School, the best journalism school Come in the on. country, and also the original, the first one. Oh, I didn't know. 1913. We need to return and talk about journalism. A little yeah, bit. yeah, yeah, we will. should. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I was trained to be ob as objective as you could. So. When I did an article, you could never tell where I stood politically because mm. I would tell both sides and I would quote the best people on both sides. And, and that's how we were trained. Yeah. Um, so I thought I'm going to do the same thing in this investigation. I'm going to call a ball a ball and strike a strike. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to try to be objective. My hope was I could liberate her from this cult. Yeah. But I was going into it honestly, saying, you know, I'm going to see what I find, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to accept something if I think it's proven and reject it if I, pro if I think it's been disproven, um, and, and that's what I embarked upon. So well, I just found this out as we were walking down here talking yeah. to your wife, that you guys ended up writing one book together. Yeah. And what's the title of that book? Uh, Spiritual Mismatch. Okay, and it's about being in an unequally yoked marriage. That's right. In part, right? Yeah, what do you do if your spouse is not a believer? And what's so interesting about that, yeah. is just for a second, is that you know, God tells us not to be unequally yoked, but yes. every once in a while, by saving one person in the marriage, he creates an unequally yoked marriage. Exactly. Which and is so strange. And this is and what happens. And then you've happens. got to deal with it. So how, how, talk about that. You know, the, the, the better the church in terms of evangelism, the more spiritually yes. mismatched marriages you're creating. And, you, and many times it is the wife. And who many first times, comes to Christ, about eighty percent. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So you're exactly right. Usually, you are getting these spiritual mismatch situations developed uh, in the church because somebody, usually the spouse, the woman, is coming to church or uh, coming to faith, and now all of a sudden there's all kinds of conflict in the relationship. Now, you know, we always used to see eye to eye. Yeah. Now we disagreed about money management. We disagreed about how to spend our leisure time. We did, we had all these disagreements. I remember she wanted to give money to the church. Hmm. And I remember saying to her, I got an idea. Instead of giving money to the church, why don't you just flush it down the toilet? <laughs> because that's the same thing. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's how I was skeptical. But um, so we had we began to have all these conflicts we'd never had before. Hmm. Um, so we wrote this book to help people. We also have a chapter in, do you date a non-believer if you're a believer? 
And you have a chapter in the book on that. On that, yeah. That's so a, if okay, somebody's yeah, yeah. thinking of dating someone who's not a believer, I have 15 ways to try to discern, are they really a believer? Yes. Because what often happens is the woman's a believer, the guy kind of feigns it, he kind of pretends it, yeah, we'll go to church, yep, oh yep, yeah. Yep, 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 and yep. then they get married, and then it's like, yeah, 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 I'm not interested. No, 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 he yeah. wants to get the job done. He wants to get married. Yes. And um, so I have like 15 things uh, it's kind of a checklist to look for in terms of trying to discern as best okay. we can. Is this really an authentic believer? Yeah. And uh, so, and then we have a 30 day prayer guide in the book, how to pray for your spouse. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we'll have to put that in the show notes so that they can get that book and, yeah. and see those things. Um, so you end up coming, now we get kind of the story that became Case for Christ and yeah. all this. So you come to faith in Christ yeah. through investigative journalism. Yes. And at the time, was it what became Case for Christ in the sense of, was it you meeting with these experts? Is that how that was? Yes and no. Um, back then, I wasn't traveling the country interviewing scholars as much as I do now and then. Um, when I was a non-believer, of course, there were very few resources out there. Today, there's a proliferation of popular-level mm -hmm. books that you can access on yes. this topic. Back then, Forget it. I mean, it was very, very little. And so I remember, for instance, uh, there was one book written by the guy who made Ye uh, Harvard Law School uh, a great law school, which is the second best law school in the country. Um, and it was in the 1800s, and he wrote a book investigating the Gospels and whether they could be trusted. So, okay, well, I would like to read that book, yeah, right? Yeah. So I go to the library. Do you have that book? Psh, no, it was published in 1887 or something. But we'll do an interlibrary loan. So we'll look for a copy. Six months later, yeah. I get a call from like, we found your book. Oh, man. And it's got rubber bands around yeah, it. You yeah, know, they yeah. found it in some obscure Life library. Life before Google and Amazon. Exactly. Yes. So it was hard back then. Now, I'm trained as a journalist, so um, it was not unusual for me to pick up the phone and call a scholar and ask a question. Yeah. I remember this one guy, I'd read some things about Ignatius, who was an early church father, yeah. and he said some things about the resurrection and so forth, and I, I'm trying to discern, is this legit? So I found a expert on Ignatius at a secular university, and I just called him up. Hey, I'm Lee Strobel. I'm, I'm a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, which was true. Yeah. He probably thought I was working on a story, which I let him believe. And uh, then I just asked him a bunch of questions. Yeah, that's great. And, okay, great, thanks. And I'd, I'd hang up. Um, uh, so it was not, I wasn't planning to write anything. Yeah. So it wasn't like I was taking copious notes. It wasn't like I was, um, you know, documenting everything. Years later, after I came to faith, and Leslie is the one who said, why don't you write a book? Uh, I said, golly, that's a great idea, but I'm going to have to really go out and re-interview some of the people I talked to yeah. and interview some new people yes. to get everything on paper, yeah. to, to tape record the interview and get everything accurate and so forth. So then, so if you if you notice in the book, it'll say, uh, it says, I retraced and expanded upon my original investigation. And uh, so then I would, I traveled the country and, and interviewed some, some great Christian scholars. Yeah, as I, well, I was coming to this interview today and I thought, I am interviewing the, inter <laughs> the interviewer. <You're> right. <laughs> and... Uh, so you are the Joe Rogan of, of Christian <laughs> interviews, or the, if, if the audience is older listening, you're That's the Larry funny. King Live. <laughs> Larry of, King Live, right. Of, of Christian interviews. Um, oh, I got to tell you something funny about yeah. Larry King. Tell me. So um, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford. Yes. You know, she was on Larry... Strong Believer. With, strong Believer. She was on Larry King. And during the show, this is being broadcast, and Larry King, if those who are younger don't know, he had this interview show on, yeah. oh, on yeah. CNN. Oh, yeah. So right in the middle of the interview, she said, she said Larry, Larry, did you ever have Lee Strobel on your show? He says, I don't know who that is. Who's Lee Stroll? He said, oh, Larry, he, he, he's Jewish. He's got a Jewish background, and he investigated the case, and he became a Christian. You ought to have him on your show. Well, I wasn't Jewish, and, and that's not really my story, <laughs> which I told her later when I met her for the first time. I said, by the way, I, I'm not Jewish, but, yeah. um, but it was so funny. To, I'm watching Larry King that night, and all of a sudden, it's like, I think those shows were live, weren't they, or something, something like that? Yeah, yeah, some version of it. And it was it, like... Yes. Oh my gosh, Leslie, come here. <laughs> <laughs> I was, did, did you end up ever going on Larry King? No, okay. never did that one. How do you go about, so you're about to interview William Lane Craig yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Uh, what's your process to yeah. get ready for an interview? How, how do you choose who to interview to begin with? Yeah. What, what is that? You mentioned briefly, you tape record it. Yes. Or probably now on a phone or something like that. But yeah. how, how's that whole process? You know, uh, first of all, you have to find out who you're going to interview. Like, for instance, I'm working on a new book right now. And I have three interviews I need to do for this new book. And so I'm discerning who do I interview on these topics. Mm -hmm. So I do a, th a thorough search of what people have written in that field. 
And then I make phone calls to people I trust and say, hey, do you know anything about this guy? Like, for instance, there was one guy I was thinking of interviewing. I called my son, who's a theologian at uh, Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. Yes. And I said, Kyle, do you know this guy? And he said, yeah, I know who he is. And I said, I'm thinking of interviewing. He said, nah, I, I wouldn't do it. Mm. I wouldn't do it. So um, so I go to people that kind of help me determine who the best person is. I want a person of character. Um, uh, and also of intellect and also scholarship. Yes. So I, I, I prefer people with PhDs from secular universities. Yeah, that's sense. my preference. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so then once I narrow it down to one person, um, I contact them and say, hey, I'm working on a book I'd like to interview. Now, the funny thing is, uh, this is counterintuitive. These people, most of the people I interviewed are kind of ivory tower academics. Yes, yes. They're brilliant. They write for a very narrow audience of, of really brilliant people. And nobody calls them out of the blue and asks them to talk to them about this stuff. The students don't care. They just yeah. want to get a grade and get out. So when you call up, like I call up Bruce Metzger. Yes. Bruce Metzger was the greatest textual critic of the 20th century. He was at Princeton University. His um, analysis of the Greek of the New Testament and so forth was unmatched. Yes. I mean, he was the number one guy in the country. And I'm thinking, I can't call Bruce Metzger. He doesn't know who I am. I was new. Nobody ever heard of me before. And uh, my friend John Ortberg said, no, call him. So I call him up, said, Dr. Metzger, I'm working on a book. You have no idea who I am. Could I come interview? Oh, of course, of course. How's Thursday? You know, no, these amazing. people love, amazing. I've never been turned down for an interview. And that includes the times when nobody knew who I was. Yeah. So then I go and usually I'll send an outline in advance. So they kind of know where the interview is going what topics I'm going to kind of ask them about. Sorry that I did not do that. Today. No, that's all right. That's all right. And then um, the funny part is you mentioned tape recording. Um, I did an interview with Charles Templeton. Oh, yes. Um, he the was... Very the, pa Remind us of who that is. Yeah, man. Charles Templeton was the pulpit partner of Billy Graham. Unreal. People thought Templeton would become the great evangelist. He was more eloquent. He was brilliant, brilliant guy, better speaker than Billy was. But he went to Princeton Seminary, liberal seminary, and lost his faith. I remember that. And became an agnostic, became the most famous skeptic in Canada. He wrote a book once called A Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. So um, I wanted to interview him for my book, Case for Faith, which was my second case book. And um, I called him up. Hey, can I come interview you? Sure. You know, well, we didn't have any money. He lived in, in a penthouse in Toronto. So Les and I drove to Toronto from Chicago. She stayed in the car and prayed the whole time. Oh, wow. This is maybe a five-hour interview. Wow. So I go up to his penthouse, and I interviewed him. Um, and in the middle of the interview, he's telling me why he doesn't believe. And I said, well, then who's Jesus? Oh, Jesus. He's the greatest person who ever lived. Anything good I've ever learned. I've learned from Jesus. Oh, he had the highest morality, the most brilliant intellect. And he's extolling Jesus. And then he goes, <gasps> and if I may put it this way, <gasps> I miss him. <sighs> and he broke down weeping. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I mean, wow. Am I a pastor or am I a writer at that point. Yeah, what do I do? Yeah, what do you, yeah. And he was embarrassed because he was crying in front of me over Jesus. And he kind of pulled himself together. And he, he dried his tears. He says, oh, enough of this, enough of this. And then we went on to other things. So um, the interview went great. And um, afterwards, I go down to the car. I said, Leslie, you can't believe what happened. He broke down weeping that he messed. messed. Let me pray, play for you the tape, a little bit of the tape. And the tape was blank. No. And the reason was I had accidentally set this old tape recorder on a setting that said it only recorded when the mic heard a voice. So it would be triggered by a voice. Well, he talked so quietly, it didn't trigger the recorder. But, oops, but I had a backup. I had a backup recorder and it got everything. Great. So the lesson I learned is, so, so recently I interviewed a guy for uh, my new book, Is God Real?, I had six tape recorders, all six right. of them. Just he in said, case. I'm setting all these. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm never going to have a backup that doesn't work yeah. or a backup to a yeah. backup. I, I record it with six tape recorders just to make sure. 
because I never want to. If I had lost it, I still have that to this day. Wow, uh, it's powerful. Well, so you tell his story, and is God real? I, I, I do, and he, he, finish the end of that story. Yeah, the rest of the story, which I don't tell till my new book, because I didn't know about it. Um, he ended up coming to faith apparently on his deathbed. Oh, no. um, he was dying, and um, his wife Madeline was not a Christian; she was an, a, a um, deist, and so she believed in a general God. Uh, so she wasn't tainting this toward yeah, yeah, Christianity. Yeah. So he's in his deathbed. He calls out, Madeline, Madeline, come here, come quick. And she comes in. She, Can you see them? They're right here. So what are you talking about? What? You can't see. The angels, they're here. They're at the foot of my bed. You can't see them. They're, they're here. They've come for me. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to God. To God. And um, wow. um, I interviewed a woman who knew him well. She was, um, actually, I take that back. I did an interview. I, I read her account of this, and she was good friends with Templeton, and she was a captain in the Salvation Army and a Christian. And she said it's her conviction that he had come to faith wow. in his own At way before he life. died. Wow. Yeah. Was he the most interesting person you've ever interviewed? And, or, oh, and if gosh. not, what is the, you've interviewed so many different people. Yeah. What, what interview are you in? And you're like, this, the time is flying. I can't believe this is you know, happening. I, <laughs> I interviewed Hugh Hefner in the Playboy Mansion. No, you did yes, not. Yes, I did. I used to have a national TV show called Faith Under Fire. And um, one of our producers said, I can get you into the Playboy Mansion to interview Hugh Hefner about his faith. I said, get me in. Whoa. So we go into the Playboy Mansion, and I'm sitting in the smoking room, or whatever yeah. you call it, yeah, the, yeah. the living area. And he comes down in his traditional silk, Oh yeah, pajamas and and smoking jacket and his pipe, and he sits down. He said, "Would you like a tour?" No, no, that's all right. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> I've I seen enough. Yeah, I've yeah. seen it. I don't need a tour. I don't want to see the grotto. No, no, this is fine. And uh, so I interviewed him about his faith or lack thereof, and it was interesting that he also was a deist. Interestingly, because as probably the quintessential narcissist of my generation, uh, who made his money off of smut. Um, he had a lot of motivation not to find the real God. Well, that's true. And because so, he would have had to change everything, and so um, he he expressed kind of a vague interest in a vague belief in a general God. But he said certainly not the God of Christianity, who I find a little too childlike. So we had this great conversation, got it all on tape, and then afterwards, oh no, I asked him. Oh no, so I asked him, what do you think of the resurrection? He said, oh. The resurrection. Well, if the re if you had any evidence for the resurrection, it would change everything because then that trips a whole bunch of dominoes. Then it means there's an afterlife. There's a life beyond this world. And so many things that we wish were true can become true Whoa. if the resurrection is accurate. He was thinking that logically. Yes. Wow. And um, so, of course, I'm interviewing him. I can't debate him in the middle of the interview, but... Um, I said, well, have you ever researched the resurrection? No, never really have. And I'm thinking, isn't that true of a lot of people? Hmm. They reject Christianity, but they've never really looked into That's it. That's true. That is true. And so after the cameras went off, uh, I gave him a copy of my bookcase for Christ. And he was fascinated. He said, oh, you're a Christian. I said, yes. He said, oh, this book looks interesting. I said, well, let's look at the table of contents. So I opened the book, and I'm kind of walking through the table of contents. And I got to the section on the resurrection, and I said, here's the historical evidence that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. Hmm. I spent two years of my life investigating this evidence and became convinced that it's true. As an atheist, I became convinced. And uh, so I encourage you to really dig into this. And he, oh, I will definitely look into it. And, and so um, um, I, I would get Christmas cards from him after that. Uh, I tried to follow up with them and never really got another personal connection, but then it kind of stopped, and um, I didn't have an open door anymore. So I don't know what happened. Unbelievable but, story. Uh, that was a, that was, I was not expecting you to say <laughs> that. I was like, William Lane Craig, are you going to mention some other you know, oh pastor gosh. or scholar that you, that you interviewed? So well, the other one that happened just recently is Bill Maher. The atheist. No, you did Wait, you were with him? I, well, no, the funny part was he was interviewing a fellow comedian who would become a Christian through my book, Case for Christ. And the, this comedian, whose name I can't remember, uh, DeStefano is his name. And he said, Bill, 
Have you re read this book, The Case for Christ? It'll tell you why this is true. And this guy was an atheist and he investigated. And I'm telling you, Bill, it's true. And he's really witnessing this is on the air to and a podcast of Bill Maher. And Bill Maher, and he said, so read the book, read the book. And Bill Maher says, okay, I will. I don't know if he ever will. How but long ago was this? This was just weeks ago. I mean, what it, are the chances that you end up on Bill Maher? I, mean, I this, know. This would be, well, you know, who he knows? does this thing in his basement now where he does this, a that's version what, of this. That's what the show was. That's right. I mean, what And are, it went yeah. viral when he did it. I mean, my gosh, everybody was forwarding this interview to me. And uh, so who knows? Who knows? Um, so I've got the interview. I also interviewed Michael Shermer who's the uh, founder of Skeptic Magazine, number one skeptic in America. Oh, wow. I interviewed him on why he doesn't believe in miracles. That was a fascinating. And when I did a book on the case for miracles, and the first three chapters in that book are an interview with Michael Shermer, the skeptic, on why there are no miracles. Interesting. And so that opens the book, and then I respond in the rest of the book to his objections because there were answers to what he wow. claimed. And uh, so yeah, I kind of I kind of enjoy the interviews with non Christians better than the ones yeah, they're more, yeah, you never yeah. know what they're going to say. Yeah. So you you you're doing investigative journalism. Yeah. Um, you end up having a career change. Yeah. Uh, I mean, multiple career changes we could say, but yeah. but talk to us about that moment where you're like, I think I'm going to leave. Yeah. This career, we, we've seen some of this. It, it, you know, I, I think I was telling you earlier. Yes. I think a sign of a healthy church is when occasionally yeah. people in that church leave their career to join uniquely what God's doing and to yes. say, I want to give my full time and yes. attention to this. Yes. You did that, I think, first by coming on staff at Willow Creek? Yes. Was that your first move? Can you tell us about that? What, what was yeah. that wrestling like? You know, I'll tell you, it's a funny thing. Um, it may have been the easiest decision I ever made uh, in the sense that I felt so clearly that God was in it. And I asked myself, if I say no to this opportunity, what's going to happen on my deathbed? Mm. my head's on the pillow in my final moments in this life. And I look back and say, I missed, I missed God's call in my life. Mm. I missed the opportunity where God was calling me to leave it all behind, take a 60% pay cut and join the staff of a church. And, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate that. It was, yeah. I, I can't do that. And so, um, the funniest thing Kyle, was that the people who tried to deter me the most were Christians. Interesting. Because they would say things like, how are you going to put your kids through school? You can't live on what they're going to pay you. That's a 60% pay cut from what you're making. You don't make that much at the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. Um, how are you ever going to put your kids through college? How are you going to support your wife? How are you going to... And, and Leslie's dad, who was an atheist, who I led to the Lord in his last conversation before he died years later, but uh, he was an atheist, and he, uh, I told him, I think I'm going to leave my whole career behind and start on a church staff. And he said, you know what? If you think you ought to do that, you ought to do it. Wow. Isn't that funny that the atheist said, yeah. "Go if that's where your heart's leading you, then go ahead and do wow. it. And the Christians are saying, eh, you know, yeah. you got to be careful. Yeah, yeah. How are you going to put food on the table? And uh, and it was hard. You know, we lived for 20 years in a little 1,100-square-foot house, and and um, um, yeah, it was, it was hard, but it was worth every moment. And you, did you have one role there, many roles? You were, you eventually were one of the teaching pastors. Yeah, it started Walker. out, I'm glad you mentioned this idea, this concept of kind of mentoring people through the local church into full-time ministry yes. at the church. We're all in full-time ministry, but you know what I mean, I vocational yeah, ministry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so originally I came on the staff as, um, um, it was called, um, oh, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but I was in charge of 750 volunteers wow. in the area of parking and baptism and um, uh, communion preparation and ushers and greeters and information booths, sort of the physical infrastructure. We call that here first impressions. Yeah, yes. something like that. I was in charge of that. I was associate director of evangelism under Mark Middleberg, and um, um, so it was pretty much an administrative role. Um, now, I felt that God was ultimately leading me to preach and teach. But I thought, you know, ego can get in the way. How do I know that's not me wanting a limelight, wanting a spotlight? Yeah. So I said, you know, if God is in this, I don't have to say anything. So I never said anything. One day, senior pastor knocks on my door, comes in and says, uh, you know, the, we, the elders have been praying, and we believe God's given you a gift of teaching and preaching. 
And if you're willing, we'd like to mentor you in that. And um, Mark Middleberg will in, uh, mentor you in theology because I didn't go to seminary. Yeah. And um, let's see where it leads. And I said, okay. But I wasn't going to be the one to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Mark mentored me for two years in, in theology. We're still best friends. And um, uh, I was mentored in preaching and teaching. And, you know, I'll tell you, <laughs> you'll love this as a, as a preacher. Uh, I remember I was writing my first sermon. And um, uh, <laughs> so I wrote it. And uh, I, I showed it to the pastor. I said, what do you think? And um, he reads it and he says, you know, it's, it's kind of common for a pastor to kind of have, I don't know, maybe three points. <laughs> he said, yeah, you know, you, you kind of blend it all together here. And that's great if you're writing an article. You don't want to be really, but it, when you're teaching, you want to kind of have these handles and Oh, well, that's a good idea. There I'll make go. three points. I'm telling you, I had no training yeah, yeah, in this. Yeah, yeah, just simple things like that. I yeah. started at the beginning. And I'll tell you what, um, in the average church, I would have been a head usher as a volunteer. But in this church, because they gave opportunities to people to grow, mm, to learn, to discover good. God's gift in their life and so forth, I was given opportunities to learn and grow and develop and ultimately was ordained and uh, became a teaching pastor at the church, and I would speak on the weekends primarily to okay. non-church people like yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So you do that for how long, roughly, you're at that church? Oh, I was there uh, from 84 to uh, 99, 2000 almost. Okay, so at yeah. the end of that's when you write Case for Christ. Right toward the end, yeah. I wasn't going to write another book. Um, I'd written one book before I was a Christian, and um, um, I thought, I'm kind of done writing, um, and then I wrote two books as a Christian. One was called Inside the Mind of Unchurched Harry and Mary, hmm. which is a book on how pastors and ministry leaders could understand the mindset of people like I was who were turned off to God. And then my second book was a fun book called um, uh, What Would Jesus Say? Hmm. Uh, and it was what, uh, what would Jesus say to Madonna and um, um, Donald Trump? who back then was just a wealthy guy, and uh, all these famous people, what would Jesus say to them? And uh, I did a series of sermons on that and turned it into a book. And, um, and then Leslie suggested I do The Case for Christ. Wow. So you're there, and then that's at Willow Creek Church, and yeah. then you go from there to Saddleback? Yeah. Uh, I met... So just for our audience to know that basically these are, the, in that day, these are two of the largest churches in America. Yeah, Willow Creek up, was yeah. the second most attended church at the time, Yes, and uh, Saddleback wasn't far behind it, Yes, which is funny because so here I am, a new preacher, making my mistakes in front of... 20,000 people. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I had some stinkers back then. I mean, I, I, remember, <laughs> I, I remember when I would come off the platform, if the pastor would shake my hand, I knew I was in good shape. But if he kind of ignored me, I you're, thought, you're not oh, good, oh, not this, good. this didn't go well. So I was learning, but making, you know, I was tripping and falling in front of thousands of people. Um, so yeah, they're both huge churches and both influential in yes. terms of having an impact on other pastors. What do you think about the church today? Like the church in America today, you know, it's been yeah. said that we live during the greatest decline of Christianity in the history of our nation. Yeah. Um, but yet you, you seem, and I, I want to get to this toward the end, yeah. but you're you're an older guy who is, you seem joyful, <laughs> you seem hopeful yeah. uh, about the next generation. Yeah. How are you feeling as you travel around, as you get yeah. to do things like today, see yeah. different churches, how are you feeling about the state of the church in America? Oh, it's a great question. You are a good interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Um, you know, it's good and bad. Mm -hmm. It's good and bad. Um, I see things happening in the church that are incredible, wonderful, inspiring. Um, uh, and then I see things where I go, oh my goodness, mm. why are they doing this in the name of Jesus? Yes. Uh, so I see both. And it doesn't have anything to do with size. Mm -hmm. There's some great churches that are huge, yeah. and there's some lousy churches that are huge. Yeah. Uh, it's not size. It's really about vision. It's really about commitment to orthodoxy. It's really about uh, adherence to a mission to reach lost people. Mm -hmm. I think when a church loses that, when they lose the mission to reach the community with the gospel, That's right. they start to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. And that is something that has to be upheld and, and, and pursued um, always. Um, so I see good and bad. I mentioned during my sermon that uh, Shane Pruitt, who's a friend of mine who preaches around the country to young people in colleges and high schools, 
says he's seen more people, young people, come to faith in Christ in the last three years than yeah. in the previous 18 years of ministry combined. Unreal. So we're seeing things. We saw this thing at Asbury where we had an outbreak of people coming to faith. Um, I see people coming to faith all the time, young people, old people. Um, and uh, so I'm encouraged because of that. Yeah. Um, now, is the culture itself becoming more... Skeptical, yes. Are they becoming more hostile? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? People say to me, well, don't you get discouraged with all the nuns, yeah. you know, the N-O-N-E, the people who say, I don't have any affiliation with the church uh, or a denomination. And, and I say, no, I'm not discouraged by the nuns. I'm encouraged by the nuns. And the reason is, uh, if you ask people of my generation back in the 1960s, are you a Christian? Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm an American. Yeah, yeah, of course right. I'm a, Were yeah. they a Christian? No, they weren't a Christian. They thought they were because they were an American. Um, nowadays, people are more honest. No, I'm not a Christian. Yeah. I would rather people be honest because yes. they weren't Christians in either case. I'd rather they be more honest and, and concede where they're at spiritually mm -hmm. than put on a phony Christian face and pretend like they're saved. That's good. So um, the, the nun thing doesn't bother me. And a lot of nuns are spiritually curious and, and open yeah. to faith. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, when you're trained in law, you're trained to be a pessimist. Mm. You know, look for all the things that can go wrong. Yes, yes. And uh, so I tend to have that bent. But when it comes to the church, when it comes to faith, I've seen God do some absolutely amazing things. And I step back and I go, you know, um, as my wife prayed for me when I was an atheist, you know, she was told, no one is beyond hope. Yeah, that's right. That's a good word. And, uh, you know, I look at a guy who became my friend after he became a Christian, uh, one of the most unlikely conversions you'd ever hear of, uh, which is Evil Knievel, uh, the motorcycle daredevil oh, yeah. rider who was a drunk, who was a gambler, who was a womanizer, who went to prison for beating up a baseball associate with a baseball bat. Uh, I mean, a business associate with a baseball bat. I mean, he was a troubled dude. Hmm. And yet, he's on the beach, and God spoke to him. Not through his ear, but in his heart. And said, wow. Robert, I've saved you more times than you'll ever know. Hmm. Now you need to come to me through my son, That's Jesus. Good. That's good. And he, he, was he was stunned by this. And he... I don't even know who Jesus is. So he called Frank Gifford, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford's yes, husband, yes. who was a famous sportscaster, and he said, Frank, you're the only Christian I know. Who's Jesus? I don't even know. I had this experience. And Frank said, um, read the case for Christ. That'll, that'll explain everything. So uh, Evil's wife, um, go, Crystal, goes on, gets him the book. He reads it. Somewhere along the way, he has a radical conversion to Christ. Unreal. Radical conversion. 180-degree change. When he gave his testimony at his baptism, 700 people spontaneously came forward to receive Christ and be baptized on the spot. 700 people in two services. Wow. Uh, when he was buried, he died about a year later, he has engraved on his tombstone, uh, Robert Evil Knievel, um, believe in Jesus Christ. Wow. He was, and I'm telling you... It, I see stuff like that. Good. That I say no faith. one yes. is beyond yes. hope. Yes. yes. And um, so I don't want to give up. I, my personal motto or my personal quest is to drag as many people to heaven with me as I can. I love it. So um, that's what gets me excited. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning is um, I'm an evangelist. People think I'm an apologist. Well, no, I just use apologetics or evidence for the faith in the service of evangelism. That's good. That's good. If I don't need it, I don't use it. I just want to reach people with the gospel. I love it. And so um, when I see someone like Evil Knievel, and I see God breaking through that hard heart yes. um, and, and touching him with that kind of experience and so forth, I go, man, what's he going to do next? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I love give that. Give me the popcorn. That I want to watch. That's expectation. It what's, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, you, you know, the culture's changed. I don't know exactly when this has happened, but Tim Keller, the late Tim yeah. Keller, he talked about there was a season where there was a positive view in our culture towards yes. Christianity. right somewhere 80s, 90s, yes. uh, then there was kind of the neutral view, right. uh, and now we live in what appears to be more of a negative view. That's right. How has apologetics, the defense of the faith, and evangelism, I like how you connected yeah. those two, yeah. how is that maybe, at one sense, we're trying to do what Christians have always done. We're yeah. trying to share right. Christ, call for repentance right. and faith. Right. How is that maybe different today? And, and maybe even the question is, if you were rewriting Case for Christ, would you be looking at some different things? If you're rewriting Case for Faith, maybe that's some of what you're even doing with yeah. some of these newer books. Yeah. 
it is what I'm doing kind of in my newer books. But um, like, for instance, in my new book, Is God Real? I have what's called the Apologetics Pyramid. And if you picture a pyramid, um, uh, to answer your question, how has it changed? Sometimes we have to take a step back and talk first about what is truth. Because most people don't believe in absolute truth. They, you have the whole my truth versus objective truth. Yeah, how do you exactly. deal with that? Exactly. So, so that's kind of the base of the pyramid. So that's mm. the broadest thing. Let's talk about what is truth. And you have a discussion. What is truth? And, and you talk about the difference between truth and opinion. And you say Plato wrestled with this. Uh, um, and Aristotle wrestled with this. And what is truth? They determined uh, truth is that which corresponds to reality. Yes. So for me to say I am in the state of North Carolina right now, that is true because it corresponds to reality. If I were to say I'm currently in Nebraska, mm. that would be false because yes. I'm not in the state of Nebraska. So truth is that which corresponds to reality. So you get that settled, and then you go to the next step, which is what worldview makes more sense. Mm. So there's only three possible worldviews. Theism, there is a God. Atheism, there is no God. Or pantheism, everything's God. Those are really the only three possibilities. Yeah, yeah. And so what is the test to try to weed out what's true and consistent with reality? Two tests, livability and logic. If a worldview is internally illogical, it contradicts itself, yes. it can't be true. If it is unlivable, it's probably not true either. Yeah, and so uh, in the book, we analyze all those three worldviews that way, and we determine that theism is the only one that survives. Well, then we go to Revelation. We talk to the Bible. Can we trust what the New Testament tells us? Then the, the pyramid is getting more narrow. We go to um, uh, Revelation, the Bible. We go to resurrection. Okay. And then the tip of the pyramid is the gospel. Hmm. My friend Chad Meister, who was a volunteer in our ministry back when I was at Willow Creek, uh, as a seminary student, and today is one of the top philosophers in the world, um, written many books on philosophy, um, uh, as a university professor now. He, um, he came up with this pyramid, and I interview him in, in my book about it, and uh, he came up with the idea to um, have dinner at his house with an atheist. And how do I engage with a skeptic these days? I got to start at this base, what is truth? Anyway, he developed this. The guy came in. They started talking through the pyramid at 7 o'clock over pizza. By 11 at night, the guy was a Christian. Wow. So um, we have to sometimes step back. But here's how it's changed my personal approach. Often I will get into a conversation with a non-believer, and I'll ask him this question. Let me just ask you a question. If you could ask God any one question and you knew he'd give you an answer right now, what would you ask him? Interesting. Well, if you ask a non-believer that question, 80% of the time, the question is going to be some permutation of, why does the loving God allow suffering? Yes, yes. So then I would step back and say, oh, well, let me answer the question. And I would give him a five-point sermon on why God allows suffering. I don't do that anymore. Thanks to my friend Gary Poole, who is a genius on interactive evangelism. And so what I do now is I'll say, if you could ask God any one question, what would you ask? I'd ask him, why, if he's a loving God, is there suffering? But then, instead of a sermon, I followed up with another question. Hmm. Oh, wow, let me ask you this. Of all the potential, potential questions in the universe, why did you ask that one? Hmm. Well, now they get personal. Now they say, because my wife was just diagnosed with cervical cancer, oh, and I yeah. want to know where's God in that. Mm. Or we lost a child in childbirth five years ago. Where was God when that happened? Now we're getting to the mm. emotional side, the feeling side, the psychological side. And that guy really doesn't need from me at that point a five-point sermon on why God allows suffering. He needs me to be Jesus to him and put my arm around his shoulder and to Powerful. weep with him yes. and to be yes. Jesus in his yes. life and to love him unconditionally. That's what he needs from me at that moment. And that's how it's, it's uh, played out in practical terms for me. You know, a lot of apologists love to quote, quote 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But they forget the next part, but do it with gentleness and yes, respect. Yes, yes, yes. And I think in this skeptical culture, gentleness and respect are at, uh, they're, all, they're supremely important. Yes. Um, uh, because so many people are walking away from the church because they see hypocrisy or they see, well, of course, churches are in perfect places. We're imperfect people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, we always say here, we're, we're the perfect example of an imperfect church. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. So anyway, yes, things are changing, but 
my friend Jay Warner Wallace. I don't know if you know him, but he was No, a, but I'm noticing you have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends. This friend, that friend, yeah. this friend. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Jay Warner was an atheist, a uh, cold case homicide investigator. He's been on Dateline many, many wow, times. Okay. He solves old murders. He worked for LA police. And he was an atheist. And he used his detective skills to investigate Christianity and became a Christian, just like I did. Wow. And I wrote the foreword to his first book, which was called Cold Case Christianity. Okay, yes, which I'm is familiar a with that book. Great yes. book. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, he said something interesting recently. He said, evangelism in the 21st century is spelled apologetics. In other words, in this culture where our children and our grandchildren and we are going to be challenged in our faith in ways that previous generations weren't, yeah. um, we need to understand why we believe what we believe. Mm. Not only to deepen our faith, but to prepare us yes, to be able to yes, share it yes. in a way that People go, oh, wow, I never thought about that before. Really? There's evidence for the resurrection? you got to be kidding me. Um, so, because uh, like Hugh Hefner, a lot of people are not believers, but they've never really looked at the evidence. Wow. So we don't have too much time left. Yeah. Want, you've got one more sermon to preach for us, by the way. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, sure. A um, couple last little questions. Yeah. One, favorite book that you've written? You've got a lot of case for. Uh, when you think about them all, are they like your kids? You love them all the yeah. same? Or, or is there one that's like, man, this is... This is my, or is it the one you're working on? Like, you that's know my what? passion project. Um, they are like your kids, and you love them all. But the one that um, a lot of people haven't heard of, mm -hmm. that is one of my favorites, is called um, The Case for Grace. Okay. And in that book, every chapter is an amazing chapter interview with a very unlikely candidate for conversion who came to faith in Christ, like Evil Knievel. He's not in that book, so that happened later. But people who you would wow. never expect to yes, come to yes, faith, yes. like one guy who was not just a murderer, he murdered not seven people, 7,000 people he murdered. He was the head of the torture center for the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Unbelievable. And he murdered 7,000 people. And after the war, he disappeared in the jungle, became a devout follower of Jesus, lived like Mother Teresa among the poor in these cities, um, ultimately came forward, admitted his crime, wow. was sentenced to prison for genocide. He sits in a prison now in, in uh, Cambodia. Um, one of the few people who gets to visit him is a pastor from L.A. who I interviewed, and he goes and serves him communion in Cambodia. And, and this guy has now led to Christ, all the guards and all the other prisoners. He's just sharing Jesus with everyone in oh, that prison. Wow. It's an authentic conversion. And so I, I had this book. Every chapter is an amazing story. Mm. And then I sat back and I said, wait a minute. People are going to read this book and say, well, he needed God. I don't need God. I'm not a murderer. I never murdered seven times. And I thought, I got to interview a nice guy who came to faith. So I found a nice guy who came to realize I'm a sinner. I need grace. And yeah. I need grace too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, one of my chapters is the nice guy who well, realized well, he needed Christ. You know, it's interesting Christ. you mention that because being in Winston-Salem, we see there's rebel. We call, I got this from Tim Keller, yeah. rebelliously lost versus religiously lost. Yeah. And we will see a lot more people often. Uh, especially their families established, they've yeah. got the job, they've got the house. Right, right. They are religiously lost. Yeah. Uh, they're lost in moralism, yes. which doesn't, you know, they need to repent of their goodness. Right. Uh, not just That's their badness. Right. That's a good way to put it. It's um, exactly true. So you mentioned a couple times you're working on a new book. Yeah. Uh, do you know what it's called? And does it yeah, have I can't really talk about it yet. Oh, you can't talk yeah, about it yet? I can't talk about okay, it. Okay, okay. Yeah. But you, what, do you even know when it's going to come out? Yes, it comes out in fall of 2025. No, I'm sorry, spring of 2025. We have a while. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll get you back on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, we should. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. <laughs> okay. Last question. Yeah. Uh, a couple years ago, I'll tell you a story first. A couple years ago, a guy who's in our church, older than you, he's in his 80s. Yeah. I know you're in your early 70s. Joyful guy. I said to him, man, I want to be like you when I'm <laughs> your age. He says to me, I said, how are you like you are? And he says, uh, the key to being vi uh, joyful as you age is to always have your dreams be bigger than your memories. Oh, that's good. I thought it was a great line. That's a great uh, line. You know, because yeah. the older someone gets, the more they talk about what they used to do or what yeah. used to happen or when their kids were in the home or, or whatever. For you, as you're, you know, in, I don't know if the appropriate way to talk about this, the last yeah. quarter of your your life, yeah. you know, yeah. you're, one, just thank you for finishing well. You know, I think oh, what, the, what the younger generation likes to, needs to see is boomers and builders who end well. Yeah. Tell, when you look back on your life, just maybe some final words to us, what are some ways that you look back and go, this is some of the reasons maybe why I am in ending well, mm. finishing well, having those, the you know, two, you have two kids? 
two, you, two, you have two, two kids, kids right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Both your kids love the Lord. Right. Right. Your yeah. son's in ministry. Yeah. Your daughter's homeschooling and writing yeah. curriculum for that. Yeah. You know, you still love and enjoy your wife. Yeah. Uh, you're still part of a church. Yeah. I mean, what are some keys to that? Wow. Um, first of all, a great spouse mm-hmm. who loves the Lord. Yes. Who keeps you accountable. And I was, you know, I'll give you an example. I was grousing this morning because I didn't sleep last night. And uh, there was noise in the hotel, and I couldn't sleep. I lay there for, at one point, three hours awake. No. And, and uh, so I was in a bad mood when I got up. And, and um, I'm kind of, you know, rough-hewn at that moment. And, and, uh, and she said, Lee, get your act together. Yeah. In other words, go to the Lord and repent and ask for him to empower you today. Wow. And, um, you know, you have to have a spouse who's willing to call you out. Yeah. When yeah. you're starting to waver or whatever, and I, you know, she's my strength, and uh, we've been married 51 years now, and um, so I think that's really important. I think I think to have accountability with a good friend. So many guys, whether they're pastors or not, this is especially true of oh, pastors, yeah, yeah, yeah. but so many guys don't have a best friend, another guy who they can share all their secrets yeah, with, yeah. and who will hold you accountable, will love you, and so forth. Mark Middleberg is that to me. So we have been best buddies since the fall of 1987, and um, I was three. I was three. Oh, you were three. (laughs) (laughs) That's how long it was. Yes, I was three years old at that point. Yes. Well, there isn't a day that goes by virtually that we don't connect, and um, um, we're best buddies. He knows every secret about me. I know every secret about him. Great. And we love each other, and we cheer each other on. I believe more in him than he believes in himself. And mm-hmm. same with me. He believes more in me than I believe in me. I love it. And so I think that's a really, really important uh, element. Um, I'll tell you something that happened to me recently that left a big impact on me and wanting to finish well. Um, I was doing a book called The Case for Heaven, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to interview a strong Christian who's about to die, who's about to go to heaven? Yeah, wow. So I went and I interviewed... Uh, one of the greatest evangelists of history, Luis Palau. Uh, Luis uh, oh, shared yeah. his faith with a billion people in his lifetime, a billion people through Unreal. his crusades around the world and festivals that he would hold and all this stuff. And he was one of my heroes and one of my good friends. And as it turned out, it was his last interview before he died. He was dying of stage four cancer. And um, this was the last interview he would give. And and so um, it's in the book, Case for Heaven. I, he talks about what it's like about to go to heaven and so forth. And then he said something to me I'll never forget, and it's changed my life in a lot of ways. He looked at me and he said, Lee, when you get to the end of your life and all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. But wow. 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 I mean... You'll never regret those times when you, when you went out on a limb and you invited someone to church. Yeah, yeah. You went out on a limb and you told your testimony to somebody at work. You went out on a limb. And, you mm. know, I mean, um, those times, and, and, and it's not like we're facing a, a firing squad. It's just mostly social awkwardness or whatever, and we overcome it because we want to have courage through the Lord and... Here he is on his deathbed saying, looking back on his life, having shared his faith with a billion people and having no regrets. And I go, I want to end that way. That's good. I want to end saying, you know what? When God opened up an opportunity, even though it was scary, because I asked Luis, um, when you share your faith one-on-one, you meet a guy in a bus and, and uh, you know, do you ever get nervous? Oh, every single time. Of course I get nervous. I said, well, that's good because I do too. Yeah, Everybody does. But when we overcome that with the help of the Lord and you, you, you go out in faith and you share your faith or whatever it is, you're courageous for Christ, you, um, you volunteer when you could be doing something be- uh, more fun, when you, whatever it is, um, you get to the end like Luis and you mm. go, I want to end like that. It's powerful. Well, let's end there, but, but tell, tell our audience where, if we want to find out more about you, yeah. uh, maybe website, social media, yeah. any way to stay connected to what you're doing. Yeah, I'm at um, www. Do you have to say that anymore? I, don't I guess think not. So. <laughs> no, no, I'm old. Uh, LeeStrobel.com. Okay, is my easiest website. place. Yep. And I'm very active on Twitter. 
Yeah. I love Twitter because okay. it's like headlines. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So okay. it's at Lee Strobel. Well, a guy who does apologetics, that would make sense. That, that yeah. would be his favorite. Oh, yeah. I've met some great people on Twitter. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And yeah. some not so great people. Can I tell you a quick, quick Yo, story? Oh, please. Come on. Sheila Walsh. You know who she is? Christian Singer. Um, I don't know her. Okay. No, she's okay. she's a um, from Scotland. Um, she has a national TV show on uh, one of the Christian networks. Anyway, she's a, a great, great Christian yeah. woman. And um, um, I met her on Twitter. Never met her. Leslie met her. I'd never met her, but we became prayer partners and encouragers on Twitter. No so we direct tweet each other. So uh, she would tweet me and say, oh, I got this thing coming up. Would you pray for Sure. You know. And then when I almost died, um, they were going to give me an MRI. And I, tw- I direct tweeted her. I said, Sheila, they put me in an MRI. I'm scared. And um, would you pray for me? Mm. And she said, yes, I will. So they put me, I mean, I've been in an MRI, it's like a big tube. I know what it is, though, yeah. Okay, and they're about to put me in the tube, and they, they give you earphones because it's noisy, and they s- flip to some random radio station, and they put you in the tube. So they put the earphones on me, they flip to a random station, they dr- slide me in the tube, I get in the tube, and it's Sheila Walsh Come on. singing a song. Come on. Yes. Your prayer partner's in My there with prayer you. prayer partner's in, and I thought, isn't that just like God to say, I got you. I got you. Sheila's praying. That's all you need, man. It's going to be fine. Yeah. And, you know, I came through it and everything. But uh, I thought that was a fun example of how social media can be be used for good. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Well, Lee, thank you. Thanks for taking time to do this podcast. I know we're about to do one more service. Thank yeah. you. And we'll, we'll I got to do another one? Well, just one Seriously? More. <laughs> and then hopefully <laughs> hopefully, some, a good night's sleep to catch oh. up on what you missed. So okay. thank you so much. And uh, maybe thanks, when you write your new book, we'll try to get yeah, you back on, that. even if it's virtually or something like that. That'd so thanks awesome. so much. Thanks, man.